and I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. Dan Schneider was the undisputable king of Nickelodeon during the golden era of the early 2000s. Showrunner of hits such as the Amanda Show, Drake and Josh and iCarly, he seemed to have the meatest touch for children entertainment. But the docuseries quite on set exposed what was going on behind the glamour and excitement of these kids' shows. And the main protagonist is Schneider's alleged inappropriate and abusive behavior towards everyone on set, including kid stars. So he decided to respond to some of these allegations in an interview on his YouTube channel with iCarly actor Boogie. In this video, we will take a look at his body language and behavior during the most pressing statements and have a better insight about if Schneider has actual regrets or maybe he's even proud of what he did. While I strongly encourage you to watch Quiet on Set, it is not necessary for this analysis, as I will make sure to explain in detail any references to the documentary. Also, this analysis should be appropriate for any audiences, and I will only make passing references to some adult jokes that Schneider snuck into these kids' shows. Hello and welcome back, my body language buddies. My name is Jesus Enrique Rosas. I'm the body language guy. And make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss any of my body language analysis and tips. Let's get down to it. Now, the first step in any analysis is to establish the circumstances and context. In this case, Schneider is making this video on a controlled environment. In the sense that we assume that the interviewer, Boogie, has been carefully chosen and he's not one of these accusers as he didn't appear in the documentary. We assume that this video interview has been created with the sole purpose of damage control in response to severe accusations since it was published uh, mere days after Quiet On Set premiered. If, for example, Schneider had made this video without any triggering documentary, the context will be a bit different. But for now, let's assume this is plain old damage control. And the fact that this is a controlled environment and Schneider has all the experience writing scripts and dialogue, we can also assume that the questions were agreed upon in advance. All this is necessary to establish that his mood throughout the interview is supported by the most comfortable conditions possible. So that actually reduces the possibility that any body language and behavior signals are the product of nervousness or distress, since he is 100% in command of this situation. The interview, I mean. Even so, when we move on to the next step, which is his posture, we notice that he is quite defensive. Most important clue is his feet, one over the other, which is a typical sign of not being willing to concede anything. That closed loop is a good indicator of how he is heavily fortified upon himself. And this is reinforced by his downward tipple over his genital area. That is also a defending and protective gesture. So right out of the gate and even controlling the situation and the questions, Schneider is defensive. But then the actual interview begins and Boogie offers Schneider the opportunity to just give it an opening statement before they move on to the questions. Take notice that since this is a behavioral analysis, we will be looking not only at body language, but also what Schneider says as well. So in the clip you're about to watch, make sure you pay attention to the emphasis he puts in the words past behaviors. Is there anything you'd like to start off with? Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult, me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret, and I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. I'm sure you noticed that Schneider is making sure to keep his body language as neutral as possible. Not only his facial expressions, but also his hand gestures and his voice. But speaking of voice tone, you heard that emphasis on the past behaviors part. And that is a signal that he wants to make it clear that all these accusations are about something he doesn't do anymore. From this point onwards, you will see that this is a recurring theme in his answers. And he also said that he's embarrassed and regrets some of these behaviors. That's an important clue that will come in handy later. 
Now, the first question refers to the massages that Schneider used to request from crew members in front of everyone, which many of the people on set thought it was uh, odd at best and creepy at worst. In this case, you're going to see the opposite. His words are rather okay-ish, but his body language uh, speaks volumes. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. The first thing I notice is that every time he says it was wrong, he looks away and raises one shoulder. The single shoulder shrug is not a direct sign that someone is lying, but it's a very good clue about how uncomfortable is the person with what they just said. So avoiding with his head instead of speaking right on and raising one shoulder tells me that he's not that comfortable with that admission. So maybe in some sense, he thinks it was not that wrong. And you might have spotted that he was denying with his head. This is not really that he's denying because in some Western cultures, and especially in the United States, there's this gesture of emphasis, moving your head from side to side, like if you were underlining with your chin. In this case, he's moving his head side to side when saying the word anybody. So it's more of an emphasis gesture than a contradiction between body language and verbal expression. And yes, you, you notice that he said, I would never do it today. Again, making sure to put that in the past. But he continues and adds something to this apology. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Uh, a couple things here. This is an admission that those uncomfortable massages that he requested from members of the crew or writers or anybody that he had power over happened in the open. Like many people witnessed that. So he 100 believed back then that there was nothing wrong with those massages and possibly he still believes it. Also, this is another pattern of behavior that could be considered as manipulative. You request these massages from people and they are going to happen in front of many other people. I'm going to speculate here, but it looks like he was making a display of power, not only to the person who gave the massage, but to anybody that happened to watch the thing. And manipulative personalities can use this kind of power displays to assert dominance over a group. Now, the following question has to do with how he made his writers feel uncomfortable. And this question is very specific. The writers of his shows. Let's see if you can spot the nuance in the way he answered. Let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Well, if the question was specific to his writers, the answer was as generic as it gets. No writer should feel uncomfortable in any writer's room. He makes sure to not address his writers directly, to not assume full responsibility. Also, he has even finished apologizing and he sneaks in the remark that inappropriate jokes and topics are normal occurrences of writers' rooms, hinting that this is something common. And for that, it shouldn't be that much of a big deal. I forgot to mention that this kind of damage control interviews are almost always structured in a way that the protagonist, in this case, Dan Schneider, will make sure to address first what he wants people to think are the most pressing topics. As in, the first couple topics you address are naturally framed as the most important. As in, the massages in public and writers being uncomfortable in the writer's room are the most urgent matters to be addressed. But this is usually misleading because PR and crisis communications experts uh, could use this to hide the actual most present topics in the middle or even near the end of the interview as a red herring. As in, this is not much of a big deal, so we are not talking about that up front. So in every apology video like this one that includes several topics, at least assume 
that the first couple topics could be a decoy to distract you from the actual bad stuff. It's not always like that, but it's a good heuristic to go by. Now, regarding the topic of writers being uncomfortable, look how he inserts himself into the matter. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green, I was scared, I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart, because I should have. Notice that for this topic, when he inserts himself in the argument, he is leaning a bit forward. This is a clue that he's a bit more engaged with this part of his answer, that this affects him more in terms of emotions. And that is also signaled by him looking at Boogie directly as he speaks. Now, that leaning forward body language leaks into the next part when he's talking about the practical jokes he pulled on the crew. But this time, it's better if you pay attention to his words. There's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong and that, that was because you know I was an inexperienced producer, I was immature, wouldn't happen today, but um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. There is uh, apples to oranges in there. What does being an inexperienced producer have to do with practical jokes on people? He's trying to justify his behavior with uh, something unrelated because you can be an inexperienced producer, but at the same time, respect boundaries with your crew. Also, he made sure to say practical jokes because the word pranks would not look good, I'm sure. But he keeps justifying himself. Um, and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year I would let that pressure get to me, which a good boss should never, ever do. Again, he makes sure to keep his body language as neutral as possible, but since he's justifying his actions, he can't help but lean into the interviewer and look at him directly almost all of the time. Also, he suggests that his behavior was because of the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year. And that is important. He said it to make sure that people are aware of all the hard work that led to his success. It has nothing to do with the apology. It does zero for damage control. But he said it anyway. But why? Well, that's a question we're about to answer in a couple minutes. But keep that verbal self-pat on the back handy. The 40 shows or more per year number. Because it will be important later on. In the next clip, his body language and voice will be even more calm as he mentions four mistakes he made back then. Just try to absorb what he's trying to communicate. Sure, I would um, snap at people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. In every apology or damage control video, you need to acknowledge mistakes. What few people realize is that you can control what you acknowledge to downplay your actual responsibilities. In this case, he mentions that he would snap at people. Sometimes he would be snarky. He would not give people the time that they needed. He would be uh, too big, in a too big of a hurry. Do you think those actions require a formal apology? I don't think so. And the same way that you can frame important and urgent issues at the start of an apology, just the same you can claim mea culpa for unimportant stuff. That's also a kind of misdirection to distract you from the actually critical matters. A good tip when you see an apology video and the person admits to certain mistakes and bad behaviors, ask yourself the question, do these actions really require a formal apology? If not, then it's possible that the person is trying to distract you from something else. Now, we are entering the meat and potatoes territory. The question is about how so many jokes in these kids' shows where double and tendres aim for a grown-up audience. Pay attention to his claims because his body language is about to change. All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm. and only funny. The changes in his body language are subtle. First, he's using more pauses between words. He wants to make himself understood clearly. And you see that his eyebrows shoot up at the same time that he nods. 
that is expecting a positive feedback from the interviewer, like, this is what happened. Just in case, watch the clip again and make sure to spot the emphasis with both body language, his voice, and his facial expression when he says, kid audience. All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny hmm. and only funny. Also, I'm not familiar with the jargon of the TV show production business, but I find it odd that he calls the documentary quite on set a show. I don't know, maybe in that industry, they call every kind of program a show, whether it's a news or a series or a documentary. One could say that with so many types of shows, they would have uh, more specific ways for addressing them. But I don't know. This is just a personal impression. Schneider calling a very serious documentary with damning allegations a show just did not sit well with me. But that sounds like downplaying it, but I could be mistaken. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong with this. The other thing is that he claims that the kids found every single joke funny, which is misleading. He's not addressing the fact that some jokes could only be picked up by adults. It's not that kids didn't find them funny, it's that kids would simply not even register them as jokes. But to be fair, that's what some movies have done in the past, and it became commonplace around that era. In fact, that's basically the formula for Shrek movies. You have an animated film that can entertain kids, but at the same time with enough references and even covered adult jokes to keep the grown-ups interested and amused. And since most of the time it's the adults who take the kids to movies, then it's a winning combination. But we are not talking about movies here. We are talking about TV series. How many adults sit at home to watch iCarly? Or Drake and Josh? Or The Amanda Show? It's not the same as in going to the movies, because these are TV shows that kids can watch at home unsupervised. So why insert adult jokes in them? Um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens, and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that, if, if that's how anyone feels. So, according to Schneider, the jokes included on those kids' shows were never adult jokes, but they are being labeled as such retroactively. Now, this is a gray area, because not every adult will identify these jokes as adult jokes. That's one thing. But if it had happened one or two times, uh, we could say that, well, one or two times in 100 episodes of different shows, I don't think that will merit a four-part documentary. But Quite On Set has enough examples, instances, and unsettling recollections, uh, including, but not limited to, Nickelodeon's producers being a little too obsessed with feet. And I'm not talking about grown-ups' feet, in, if you know what I mean. So it's inevitable for Snyder to get nervous about these statements, and that nervousness must be the reason why he displayed that pacifying gesture, scratching the side of his mouth. That doesn't mean he's guilty, but that something bothers him, because since Quite On Set was published, a ton of other covered adult joke examples from Nickelodeon shows and allegations have been popping up on social media. And then he gives the solution and makes sure to spot Boogie's reaction to what he's about to say. Let's cut those jokes out of the show, just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like it. The more people who like the shows, the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. Yeah, it's odd that he had some sort of smile at the end of that statement. But look, we will know that things have changed in the past 20 years. Now we could say that there are many more snowflakes that get offended by anything nowadays because, uh, well, uh, that's a fact. So it would not be surprising that level-headed people who are not fully aware of this case could say that ah, this is another attempt at cancel culture, that someone made some jokes 20 years ago and the cancel mob went full torches and pitforks to claim the head of the showrunner. Well, there is a huge distinction in here. We are not talking about adult shows 20 years ago, but kids' shows 20 years ago. 
And back then, those jokes were already inappropriate. But he said it. Every single joke was written for a kid audience. I have the feeling that this sentence that came out of his mouth is going to come back to haunt him in the very near future. But now he goes full deflecting this blame and claiming that he did not have complete power or responsibility over his shows. Listen. The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny. Okay. We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. What I see in his body language is, is still calm and collected, confident of what he says, that he had levels of management over him. But let's keep watching. Approval at every stage, really. Okay. And I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sets, dialogue, jokes, everything. Now, when you say approval, these, obviously that's a hierarchy, not your no, colleagues right. or people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleagues. No, these are my bosses. Bosses, and then their bosses, and then their bosses. Well, he mentions that every single aspect of these shows require approval from above, including, uh, now that he mentions it, wardrobe. And this is maybe beyond the scope of this video, but I recommend that you read about Jeanette McCurdy's unsettling experience with a wardrobe fitting for an iCarly episode. But let's talk about all those levels of management that Schneider claims. Yes, there are levels and levels of management in organizations as big as Nickelodeon, and you can imagine that for an organization to be efficient, not every single one of those levels of management and executives are going to read every single script. That would simply be not practical. Schneider was the showrunner of these shows. He was in charge of them. He had the authority and the responsibility for what was going on. But let's imagine that there is at least one or two levels over him that had to green light the scripts. And I need to reference one part of the documentary when it mentions a scene in which Ariana Grande is trying to extract juice from a potato. Let's say that this scene was uh, odd. But what happens if we see it as a screenplay, as just a text, a script that upper management is going to read? They're going to see just that. Text. They're going to read the lines, she grabs a potato, squeezes it, and begins to make grunting noises. Uh, that's all that they're going to read. So upon reading it as plain text, they could say, well, that doesn't sound much fun to me, but it doesn't sound exactly inappropriate either. So I'm sure that the final product is going to be funny. Because a TV show is not only the script. There will be a setting, the acting, the wardrobe, the body language, everything. So my guess is that even if people read those scripts, many of those adult jokes went over their heads just for the reason that they were read directly from a white piece of paper that was just plain text. But when you see the final product, that's when it dawns on you. What was the intention behind this? And maybe that was the reason why uh, the camera, for some reason, stayed far too long on Jamie Lynn's face on that Zoe 101 episode. Because that's the thing that the producer, the showrunner, is in charge of. In spite of the director's artistic vision and the editor's need to nail the right pacing, the showrunner ultimately signs off how the final product is going to look. But Schneider also mentioned the rest of the adults on set. And they're approving all of this stuff. Okay. Okay? And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families. Everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that, that's not appropriate, then it would have been cut out. So, why these kids' parents, who were usually on set, witnessing all this, never said anything or pushed back? Well, the fact is that many parents did push back. That's explained in the documentary. But their main concern were not about the odd jokes, but in fact, about some behaviors from the adults on set that were inappropriate. And they also push back against the premature adultification of their teens. So it's misleading to claim that parents or guardians did not push back about what was happening. Also, these star teens were pressured by their managers and the showrunners to emancipate themselves from their parents to effectively become independent. Because 
that would give them more freedom to do everything that they should be doing in terms of the industry, the, the, the marketing, the, the PR, the tours, and the grueling schedule of show business. One can only imagine all the pressure that these kids were facing at that difficult age when so many changes were happening. Changes in their bodies, changes in their psyche, everything changing so fast that at the same time, they realize that if you grew up, you will no longer fit in your current character. So it's like you have this pressure about just having a couple of years or three years at best. And that is if you comply with everything that the industry needs. So the parents could raise their eyebrows at the showrunners and executives. But if the real conflict was happening inside their own homes with their own kids, that's a different kind of struggle. I am not justifying anyone's actions, but try to look at the situation through these parents' eyes. How they experience their kids living the dream of starring in a kid's show, not to mention the money that was coming in. In the end, it boils down to what would you have done in that situation if, for example, you had seen your teenage daughter in this situation. If nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that, I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. So we have talked about upper management and the parents and guardians. But another question is, why didn't the employees say anything about what was happening? And it is partially explained in the documentary. Most of them were afraid of jeopardizing their jobs in an extremely competitive industry. Not to mention that the show production schedule was tighter than anyone can imagine. If we go by the measure that Schneider claims that they produced 40 episodes or more in one year, that must have been brutal. That is basically one episode every week, roughly, and that also meant that anybody who was let go or quit was replaced immediately because that frantic schedule simply could not be stopped. So anybody working on that setting would have realized not only that they had to acquiesce to Snyder's abuse, but that if they complained, they could be replaced at the blink of an eye since absolutely nobody was indispensable. Not to mention the covered threats that they would never work in the industry again. But anyway, if you're an employee, for example, a cameraman or an editor in these shows, the first thing that you're going to say is, well, why should I complain if the parents aren't complaining? There's also what I call the Steve Jobs effect. The Steve Jobs effect is about all those instances that we have heard about Steve Jobs being an absolute jerk, which was pretty much every single anecdote we have of Steve Jobs. Like Jobs was obsessive, had no filter, and could be a complete arsehole most of the time, treat employees like trash, give them PTSD, whatever, but he built this successful company, Apple. He did it because that's what was needed to be done, and nobody else could do it, and believe it or not, that is a thing. Regardless of what LinkedIn posts want you to think, more often than not, this kind of toxic behaviors are praise. Even if people claim the contrary. Oh, he knew what was needed to do, so that's why he acted like a jerk. Going back to Schneider, some of the employees pointed out in the documentary that they had this feeling that the only one who could pull this off was Dan Schneider. So to some extent, he had the right to be acting like that. Maybe there was a reason behind that madness, because only a despot could have that level of productivity and success. And that is blatantly wrong. Maybe, yes, sociopaths have a higher level of success in management and executive positions than the rest of the population. That is a thing. But they are not more successful because they are sociopaths. That is messing correlation with causation. So if you and many other people believe that a successful boss must behave this way, then you will let it pass because he's just getting the work done. When in reality, nobody should allow anyone to treat them like this. Now, just for the sake of comparison, in the following clip about two female writers sharing one salary, I noticed that Snyder's body language was extremely relaxed. He was talking in a confident manner, and he seemed pretty sure of what he was talking about. But see it for yourself. Yeah, but we saw these two women 
who were writers for you sharing one salary. How mm -hmm. does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. That doesn't mean that he couldn't have been responsible for that, because uh, I'm sure that a man with his power should have the ability to get people paid while they deserve to be paid. But he continues. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers, and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer, and they split a salary. So and these are all first-time writers? All first-time writers looking for their first gig. A possible explanation to such a confident body language is that, yes, what he just described is something that actually happens in show business. And that is one of the perks of speaking in general terms. Remember that he already spoke in general terms a few clips ago, precisely to avoid referring to his writers? So this could be the same strategy, that you talk about some generic fact about the industry, but not address the issue directly related to you. Keep that tip in mind. Now, this is a part of the interview when they address the Drake Bell scandal. Again, to keep this video family friendly, I will not address the gruesome details, but I will only mention that the perpetrator in question was Brian Peck. And Snyder makes sure to distance himself from the guy. Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Okay. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. This was an important question because uh, we're talking of a direct link to perhaps the most evil and disgusting individual feature in the documentary. Schneider's body language freezes and he only uses his facial muscles to answer. He knows this is rocky territory, so he must tread carefully. So he just focuses on the fact that he didn't hire Brian Peck. That should be enough, right? Uh, well, one thing is that you didn't hire someone, but the idea is to at least foster a friendly working environment so people are not afraid to talk to you about inappropriate things happening on the set. And by this point, you already know that this was not precisely the work environment fostered by Snyder. Now, in the following clip, Snyder's body language almost freezes again, but there's one sentence that gives another glimpse into his personality. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. Yeah, when Drake and I talk about what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career. How can you possibly compare anything that has happened to you in your professional career with what Drake went through? Anything that ever happened to me in my career is making this about himself. It's baffling to watch. He doesn't bat an eye. That's the kind of small clues that are easy to miss, but give you glimpses into someone's actual opinion about the events. Like, I am the victim here. And not only that, I was sometimes the hero. And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, of course, and I did. Okay, I am not going to judge his tears. Maybe he was really moved about recalling those events. That could be a thing. But the problem is that inserting himself as the main character, it's something that makes it really hard for us to empathize with his alleged sorrow. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career. Yeah, this was one of the strongest dissonances of the interview. He's talking about Drake Bell's struggle, which was horrific. He's talking about Drake's mother and that the perpetrator ultimately went to prison and served his time. And this is the darkest part of his career. 
I mean, those are his words. Is he making this about himself again? Does it mean that we should feel pity for him? You be the judge. Now, the, this next part of the interview is a bit boring, so I'm going to paraphrase it. Here, Schneider inadvertently revealed that he's got exactly zero empathy with children. He claims that kid stars should have a therapist to oversee the process of uh, starring in a kid's show. So kids should be informed of what that means. What are the implications of being famous, the dangers of social media, and the very real threat of online harassment, and what it's going to mean for your family dynamics. That sounds reasonable, right? But the problem is that it sounds reasonable from an adult perspective. Uh, this is misleading because a child cannot grasp the actual dangers of fame. I tried to come up with an analogy for this. Imagine, for example, that someone that has never burned himself. Zero accidents with matches, no bad experiences with ovens, and campfires have always been cool or warm, if you think about it. Uh, but someone that has never experienced the sensation of burning their skin accidentally. And all of a sudden, people begin to tell him, hey, playing with matches is fun, but you could burn yourself and it's going to be very painful. You should be aware of that. He will understand your words. That is plain English. They may have the idea that it's going to be painful. But since he has not experienced the pain himself, it will not be surprising that they just say, well, I saw a guy playing with fire at the circus. It looks so cool. I, I will take my chances. You could explain a child what fame entails, social media dangers and family issues that could arise, and all the evil people in the world. And no, they, they will not be ready to grasp any of that. In fact, you would have to hide some details from them because said details will be too gruesome. So the only line of defense are the parents or guardians. That's why this tells me that Dan Schneider doesn't really have empathy with kids. Because anyone with the slightest empathy with children would know that no matter how you explain the risks, they will not be able to make an informed decision about that. Since they have never been burned, since they have never been famous, and in fact, to many children and teens, fame looks really cool, because they look at it from a school or neighborhood perspective. In fact, social media fame looks really cool as well. And they don't think this is going to hurt their relationship with their family because they have never experienced the relationship with their family being hurt. So I don't think they're going to be aware of the danger, no matter how good the therapists. So that's why parents are so important in this process. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people and everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. This is pretty much like when he acknowledged that he wouldn't snap at people. Sometimes he would be snarky. He would not give people the time that they needed. He would be in too big of a hurry. It's the same lukewarm attempt at show accountability, but for lesser events. Events that would not need an apology in the first place. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career. I told you near the beginning that Snyder was hell-bent on getting the message out that all this was past behavior. That's why now he has said earlier years of my career. And you notice that the guy has a way with words because every time he addresses that motive, he uses different expressions to convey the same thing. So. It's a covered way from as many angles as possible to leave that in the past. But does it mean that he shouldn't be accountable for past behavior? Now, if you have been paying attention, the following clip will ring a bell. Look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids, and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I 
Do you remember a few minutes ago when he made sure to mention that he was making 40 plus episodes a year? Well, he has just done the same thing. I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that. Once more, these are the remarks that have nothing to do with either an apology or damage control. Now, I see these not so subtle hints about his professional record as a way to justify his actions. And even if he's playing with his body language cards very close to his chest, those small slips give you a better idea that he's not really that sorry. Because he did a great job and that's what mattered to him. I'd just be nicer as often as possible and listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Well, I hope that he gets to keep that promise, but what his body language and behavior has revealed so far is that we don't know to what extent the end justifies the means for Dan Schneider. Now, as I already mentioned, this topic is blowing up right now and tons of clips are resurfacing in every social media platform. So. I'm sure this will not be the last time we hear from Dan Schneider. But I would like to know what you think about this in the comments. Don't forget to download my free 100 body language tips in the description of this video. My name is Jesus Enrique Rosas, I'm the body language guy. Remember, much love and bliss.